Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Google Hangout. This Google Hangout on air, actually, sponsored by DeVry University. I'm excited to host today's discussion. My name is Peter Waltz. I'm a social media consultant that works with companies to increase their social literacy and ultimately enlarge their social business footprint. And in the course of that, I also get the opportunity to host many different types of online events and chats and discussions like this one. It's always great to work with the people at DeVry as well, especially when we bring important topics to light like this one. The subject for today's discussion is all about cybercrime and the attacks that occur every day online against some of the world's largest and seemingly most secure organizations. We're going to talk about the role of the cybersecurity professional in business today and then explore some of the career opportunities in the growing field of cybersecurity. Joining me on the Hangout are two experts in cybersecurity, Bob Bungie and Tasso Triantafilos. Gentlemen, why don't you say hello to our audience? Introduce yourself. Share a little bit about your background. Hi, I'm Bob Bungie. I'm an associate professor of network engineering here at DeVry's Federal Way campus in the Seattle Metro. I've been studying and working with cybersecurity for over five years now. I'm coach of our Cyber Defense Club, and I'm uh, pleased to meet you all this morning. Uh, Tasso, take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tasso Giantafilos. I'm the senior vice president at one of the world's largest financial institutions. I've been in technology for about 15 years. I started working with dot com in the dot com era with uh, server and network uh, technologies. Uh, went into the financial industry back in 2000, started off working in storage technologies, ended up working in cybersecurity. Uh, during this time, I think the biggest challenge uh, for me has been to translate the technology that you see in the business world into the technology, um, into the business world, into the technology world. So. Um, I'm hoping that um, we can probably touch on a couple of those things here, and uh, thank you. Great. To start our conversation, and, and cyber crime is in the news everywhere. I think we were chatting just on top of the call that it is probably the largest single cost of uh, the most expensive crime on the planet today. There was an article late last month in Bloomberg News that talked about cyber attacks on U.S. banks expose vulnerabilities. And uh, it was very interesting. It described a series of cyber attacks that attacked at least six major banks and prevented consumers from accessing their information by initiating something called a denial of service attack. The experts said that these attacks, while they're not the most sophisticated and they don't always compromise consumer accounts, they're still very difficult to defend against and they signal a need for stronger cyber defense, even in our largest companies. To fight this trend for cyber attacks, we also know from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that companies are really beginning to staff up on professionals, thus spawning a need for more skilled people like system analysts and information security people and network systems administrators. And while firms are doing all this staffing up now, it's also expected that's going to continue to grow in the coming years across industries. And it's not just private sector, the government, as well as verticals like financial institutions, private companies all really good news for our graduates coming into the workforce in this field. Let's get the dialogue started though. Bob, why don't you explain a little more about this article that came out on the cyber crisis in the banking industry and then we'll take it from there. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, great. Let me speak to two points. First, motivation and then a little bit about the technology behind the attack. As far as motivation, it appears that this one is hacktivism. Somebody out there has a grudge against the United States and they decided to make a statement by taking down some of our major banks. Um, with respect to the technology involved, the simplest way to put it is imagine the effect of 10 million pieces of junk mail if they all showed up at either your home or your office. That's essentially what's going on. They're just clogging the internet with junk messages and trying to tie up servers and bring them down. Yeah, Bob. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so Bob, I absolutely agree with you that um, their, their attempt is to disrupt the actual network flow to these systems, uh, impact the consumer's ability to reach these systems and perform transactions. So these are very, you know, uh, vulnerable systems, especially when you're dealing with the uh, Internet. So they could definitely cause issues for people wanting to reach a specific website or perform a specific transaction online. Well, Tasso, I mean, clearly the financial systems are the most sophisticated we have on the planet. So how do things like this happen and how do we protect for them? I mean, it seems, it seems odd that, that a simple thing like this could break through the security that's there. Fill us in a little bit on what the marketplace has in terms of technology behind this. Well, we're constantly going to be driving out new innovation, new technologies, new methodologies on how to prevent these sorts of attacks from happening. 
but there's always going to be a desire for a hacktivist to go out there and impact or cause some sort of disruption or, or havoc in the corporate workplace. So uh, there's always going to be a desire. It's going to be tough for us to continue battling, but uh, I think uh, we're heading in the right direction because the economy, the actually industry is very, very aware of uh, those emerging threats. Let me just uh, throw in a little bit technically about how this thing was pulled off. This wasn't spontaneous. This thing was planned months in advance. Uh, the attackers leveraged something called a botnet, which means they spent months getting their way into numerous high-powered servers all over the world. So when the attack launched, it came from hundreds of directions at once with some very high-powered equipment behind it. And um, that was something that had to be set up and coordinated in order to happen at all. Yeah, Bob, I agree. Those are very well-coordinated attacks. And that's, that's, the, that's a tough part, how to beat, because these are very, very well-organized attacks. So, guys, this is something that, you know, could happen on a grander scale, it sounds like. This isn't an isolated event. This could happen in, in a significant way? Absolutely. Now, botnets are just a standard issue uh, malware that's out there. I mean, organized crime uses them all the time to perpetrate frauds and thefts and things like that. But they also lease their botnets to the highest bidder. And so somebody who's a hacktivist or a, a rival of the U.S. could simply lease botnets that are, have been developed over a period of months by some shady characters all over the world. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an e-commerce or a licensing business on the black market just to rent the software to kind of cause this kind of problem. Is that what you're saying, Bob? Absolutely. The black market has their own software industry. They're very sophisticated. I was just at a Secure World conference this week, and that was one of the keynote addresses was the whole uh, business development model and software development life cycle of the, uh, of the malware industry. It's extremely large, very sophisticated, and in many countries around the world, it's frankly one of the best job opportunities. You know, there were a couple other articles that uh, that came out even in the last couple of days. One in Columbia, South Carolina, where 657,000 business records were taken during a D&D &D credibility corporation update. The governor's in the hot seat in a big way there to try and justify how they're going to work that out. And then just yesterday, uh, Janet Napolitano talked about the relationship between Hurricane Sandy and the devastation it caused and said, you know, a cyber attack on our utility systems could replicate what happened in the natural case with Hurricane Sandy even on a broader scale. So this is just not limited to simple you know, transactions on the Internet or individual consumers. It could spread across any systems. Is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right, um, Peter. Vulnerabilities are constantly exploited by these hacktivists or organized groups. Uh, if you add in human error, uh, human mistakes are, are done day to day in um, their operation centers and then you add technology failures. Technology will eventually fail. So when you add all those things you definitely are looking at a possible or potential larger scale. Well, well Tasso, in your industry, I mean it, I've just picked up, you know, this was a quick Google, I found three. How often does this happen? Is this a daily occurrence in the in the financial services industry or fill us in on that? It is. It's, it's happening constantly on day in and day out. I mean, for example, if you just look at the Department of Homeland Security, they have anywhere from 5,500 you know, cyber incidents in the year 2006 all the way to the most recent numbers that came out were about 43,000 last year. Wow. So those numbers have increased. Bob, what are you hearing about some of the, the frequency of these kind of things? Well, again, I was just at a conference very recently, and they said that in today's world, antivirus vendors need to update essentially every five minutes. Uh, they have follow the sun teams to analyze the latest threats, so they'll start working with an Asian team, and when they check out, the European takes, team takes over, and then they hand off to the North American team. So it has to be a 24 by 7 real-time response. Anything less than that is inadequate to meet the, uh, the threat, and even that doesn't meet all of the threats. They, but Bob, to comment on that a little bit, if you think about, if you multiply that by every single company and they start going out there and updating every five minutes and you multiply that by X number of companies, we don't have the right infrastructure or support out there to actually make this happen. Unbelievable. Well, let's, you know, guys, we're all, uh, Tasso, you're in the business and you're trying to solve problems from a corporate level. Bob, you have the – but let's talk about consumers. I mean, what can consumers do to protect themselves in these kind of scenarios? Is there something we can be doing uh, individually to help protect our identity and help protect our records? 
Yeah, let me say absolutely the individual consumer has to get involved. The reason botnets even happen is because people leave vulnerable systems. So they'll take over home PCs, they'll launch attack from there. Of course, they'd rather have big commercial servers, but frankly, they'll take what they can get. Um, now, the, on an individual level, uh, we don't have enough time today for me to go into the right level of detail, but I'm putting some blog posts out there that they give a simple model I call ARTS, Asset, Risk, Tool, Strategies. And that gives a framework for even the ordinary consumer to uh, take inventory on what they have and to address it with appropriate responses. Yeah. And these are the same type of controls that we in the corporate world start using. I mean, deterring, detecting, preventing, and defending against those types of threats. Uh, it's also always up to the individual, uh, whether it's consumer or the user, uh, to make sure that they don't allow anyone to um, receive or tap into information that they shouldn't be. I think, guys, we've identified the problem, and it is immeasurable. It's crossing every industry. It's crossing every utility, financial services, personal consumers. So we know there's a problem out there. Let's talk about the responders. I'd like to shift the conversation from the problem to those who actually work and solve the problem. Tasso, the people that are on your team, Bob, the people that you are training at DeVry to move people through here. Tasso, help us understand when something like this happens, and let's go back to the denial of service attack. What are the steps that take place? What's the first thing that happens at the bank, and who are the people that take care of that? Oh, well, we, we have a large team that actually is responsible for monitoring any type of threats. We have individuals that actually sit inside of these sometimes hacktivist forums and monitor kind of type dialogue to, to sort of uh, become aware, more aware of when these are occurring or when they're going to occur. Uh, and then we have individuals that sit by and, and, and monitor these responses, these incidents, and work with uh, other organizations, other external organizations, uh, even the federal agencies, uh, to actually prevent or stop these sorts of attacks. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a huge human capital that's invested behind this. And what are some of the positions? What are they? What are, what are the names of those positions? Are they unique to the cybersecurity industry, or fill me in on some of the titles? Well, you, have, you know, again, these are specific skill, skill sets. Uh, whether network engineers. Um, uh, Encrypt, encrypt, encrypting uh, professionals that know everything about you know how packets are encrypted or decrypted, uh, IP individuals that know everything about TCP/IP. Uh, so there's they span across the various different uh, fields we have today, whether they're network or or coding developers. And Bob, what are we finding out in terms of the training we're providing uh, people going out into the industry? What are some of the career titles you've seen? I've seen all kinds of things. Uh, let me just add that uh, probably at least half of the security professionals I meet are essentially on the business side of the house, so it's not just a technician kind of career path. There's plenty of people doing risk management, audit, penetration, penetration testing, um, quality assurance, uh, legal dimensions of this, and so it's, it's top to bottom business management and technology. I've had students in my classes that have become professional penetration testers. Um, we have people that are doing network management. We have people that are doing uh, various systems engineering. Uh, another thing I'd like to emphasize with respect to our network manage communications management curriculum is security has to be baked into everything. You have to be thinking security in, in basic software development. You have to be thinking about it in network design. You have to be thinking about it in business management, disaster recovery, contingency plans, HR. I mean, security has to be baked into the whole cake, otherwise it's not going to work. Well, that's, that's, that's some great insight. Bob, let's talk about the training and the degrees that these responders have to have. We highlighted some of the positions at the top of the program, but fill us in a bit on specifically what type of training, what type of degrees do these responders have? Well, the industry will take what it can get. Obviously, the ideal candidate has both a college degree and multiple certifications, but that's the ideal candidate. The reality is the industry needs talent. It needs talent now, and the most important thing is proven experience and ability to get the job done. That's why, for example, our Cyber Defense Club members are basically flying off the shelf in their job interviews because in the cyber defense competitions, they show under stress that they can get the job done. So they're getting very good entry-level positions that way. Um, now, there's an ongoing debate about certifications versus degrees. Uh, some federal positions require very specific certifications. 
Uh, likewise, your defense-related positions will require security clearances. So young people thinking about this need to consider their behavior and make sure they're not complicating their life by uh, putting some red flags up there for an eventual security check. Um, I would say, however, that I, I like uh, our bachelor degree programs are very good and Keller's master's degree programs are very good as well. I think there's a lot of useful information there and you can certainly get a job that way. I also, again, want to stress you do not have to have a technical major. You can get these jobs out of accounting and you can get them out of project management. These type of skills are highly valued in the security industry and many security leaders come from that type of background. Tasso, what are you finding in the people that you're looking for? What type of background do they have? So most people that we end up hiring or bring in as a consultant usually have a very good understanding of both technology or business concepts. Uh, most of them are very adaptive and willing to learn new technologies or new processes or methodologies. Uh, they're all team players. They all must learn how to play well within the sandbox uh, of um, teams of five through you know, 100, 150 people. Um, and they're not afraid to speak up. That's the most important thing. Uh, when you identify an issue or, or something that we need to work through, they, they speak up and offer a solution around it. And Bob, based on what you said, this is not a nine to five job. This is a global, what you call it, sun up, sundown? How was that description again? I follow the sun. I mean, yeah, they have teams all over the world. And, and you know, the, the people that are first responders to this, this sort of thing, their pagers are going off all the time. I mean, you know, they get the proverbial 3 a.m. phone call, you know, at any moment. And sometimes when they volunteer for our events, all of a sudden they have to pick up and leave and go back to the office. You know, like one guy said, oh, you know, the Brazilians are in my network. I got to go. You know, and that kind of thing is pretty routine. And it's not only isolated to the technologists, it's also to the business side of the house as well. So you have auditors, you have regulators, you have uh, business executives on those calls as well that get paged in the middle of the night. So it's gone beyond just getting, you know, the technologists getting paged out at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, so when we have some of these events happen, I just want to, again, take, try and get a sense of the magnitude of the, of the number of responders in this. Give me a sense, Tasso, on, on, in your organization globally, how many people would you say have risk or cyber threat as a part of their job description? It's at least several hundred. Several, several hundred individuals. Mm -hmm. And then, Bob, are you having people in your organizations? I know that DeVry is unique in that it, uh, there's a blend of people that are in undergraduate or graduate programs, and there are those that are also getting their degree at DeVry while they're also in the workplace. Can you reference some of the people that are in your classes that are already in the space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, a gentleman just graduated. He's been a professional penetration test or consultant for the last six months. He told some incredible stories about the things that he does on the job. For example, he uh, he finds his way into companies typically by getting into their email. Then he, he dummies up a fake offer for a free iPad if you just click on a link. Once you click on the link, he owns you because he now gets all of your login credentials and he uses those to do other things. So, I mean, banks hire him to basically hack against their system all week long and uh, his supervisor wants him to penetrate and get in and his report shows how he exposed the uh, the bank or the other um, client you know how he talked his way around things he had another great story about how he um, he got into basically the cafeteria Wi-Fi kicked everybody off technically then they all logged back in with their real corporate name and password he owned all of that and then he used it to do whatever he wanted to so I mean, this is a guy who's just, he's going to graduate next month. He was just in my class last week, finishing up his last thing. Uh, I've also have some guys that work for professional firewall companies like WatchGuard or F5. And so that's a rich source of information for our students that are in training. Interesting. The guy who fixed the cafeteria, he probably loaded up meatloaf for the following month. So that company has him to blame for the menu too as well, I bet. Well, you know, the he, he got in, he got the credentials in the cafeteria, but the credentials were the credentials to the vault. There you go, and they're kept in the cafeteria. How about that? So there's a there's interesting. It's interesting how we take it bandwidth for for granted. You know, everything is an opportunity to break in behind the wall. We see it as convenience, but but these criminals see it as opportunity. And a lot of the opportunities being driven out of uh, the type of controls we just mentioned earlier, right? So you have deter, detect, prevent, and defend. Um, when you start talking about social engineering, what, what Bob just mentioned around phishing, phishing attacks, they extract information from you to you know, get into your network, that happens more frequently than you're aware. So that is a, a real issue. 
you know, I think there's there's a there's an open there's an open issue here even on consumer education. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a United Airlines your ticket to Tahiti is now ready for pickup, or your your Amazon purchases happen, or your eBay 25 iPads shipping to Brazil has happened. Those are all fishing expeditions for people to just get me to click on and verify who I am. Is that right? Yes, I just got a free round trip ticket to Tahiti a couple weeks ago. You did. You must be on the same flight as I am. Tom. Yes, I am. Let's yeah. let's talk. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, well, I was just going to mention that uh, most experts agree that web application attacks like that are the number one threat nowadays. And on a technical level, without going too deeply into it, what they want you to do is click on the link. Okay, if you don't click on the link, they're not going to get away with it. So always, 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 before you click on the link, ask yourself, could this possibly be real? If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. You can also hover over the link and look at what the address is. If it looks like a funny address, if it doesn't look like it's the real company, you don't want to click on it. Period. End of discussion. Right. Good. Good advice. Go ahead, Tasso. Yeah, never give information that you don't have to give out. I mean, uh, when I look at an email that comes through, I first look at is the link real? Would my bank really be asking for this information over an email? Uh, are they redirecting me to a, another outside, what they're calling a, another partner, for me to enter more information? And if it's real, then I'm sure I'll be receiving a call from them. So typically, every email I receive, I just delete or ignore. Because in a lot of those cases, about 95, maybe 99% of those cases, they're, they're not real emails. Crazy. Guys, let's talk about the role of cybercrime, cybersecurity rather, in the enterprise risk equation. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about how organizations, private and public, manage enterprise risk. And in the financial services industry specific, what's, what are the things that companies can do to be aware, prevent further attacks? What can be done in that space? So um, what we, we typically do is uh, we mitigate risk, right? Our, my whole purpose in my job is to mitigate risk throughout the enterprise. Uh, we educate consumers, our end users. Uh, we deploy new technologies and replace older legacy systems that are considered vulnerable systems. Or we streamline or, or, or build up or create new processes to improve what we've done in the past moving forward. So a lot of those things, you know, it's pretty much education awareness. That's where it starts from. And Bob, is there anything in the curriculum that talks about risk management or enterprise risk and what we're teaching today? Absolutely. Uh, now, I took a uh, six-course sequence in Keller Graduate School of Management specifically on IT security, and risk management was a big part of that. I was surprised to learn how much uh, IT risk management and compliance is baked into every corporation's responsibility nowadays. Uh, there's a whole alphabet soup of compliance standards that need to be met, from SAS 70 to FISMA to FERPA to HIPAA to uh, COVID to uh, ISO 2701, it just goes on and on and on. So there's a whole army of uh, auditors out there and quality assurance testers that are performing formal compliance uh, management and inspection and testing on every major company in the country. Another one that's very, uh, very widespread is PCI DSS, which is an obligation of anybody that takes a credit card swipe has to go through a 12-point inspection every single year in order to qualify to keep accepting Visa and MasterCard. So uh, again, the audit profession, the accounting profession is heavily involved with this nowadays. And it's really, as we go forward, um, you have to see our whole business management infrastructure across the board is becoming intimately tied in with testing and quality assurance for IT security. Interesting. Guys, um, I, I want to move on to the career side, but I got one more question on the on kind of the responder side. And we talked a lot about technology and infrastructure and how we manage systems, but clearly, when things like this happen, when the state of South Carolina or or these banks have got to deal with consumers, there's a large portion of this that is reputational risk, that is customer facing, and this occurs regardless of whether it's government or whether it's uh, in a in a in a consumer business. What's the role of companies when it comes to informing the public about these threats? And Tasso, I'd like you to tell us when this had, when this hits your bank, what role does PR and public interface have to do in communicating? When do you communicate, and when do you not communicate? Yeah, it's it's definitely the most sensitive topic. I think, uh, in my opinion, I think it's the most sensitive topic. I think it's very um, you have to be very careful how you approach and communicate certain information, and you have to know. Uh, 
if a customer was impacted, if their data was exposed to you know a, a potential um, phishing attack or, or, or malware or any whatever it is, uh, you have to be very specific and know exactly the extent of the damage. So uh, we're very careful whenever we look at any type of incident, uh, and we make sure that if it's impacted our customers, uh, we need to first you know make sure our customers are not impacted, our customers have not lost their data, and protect our brand. Great. Bob, are there anything are there anything in the in the curriculum around PR or communications? I mean, we mentioned you don't have to be a technologist to be in this industry. Do we find people that are actually on the marketing communication side or the PR side that focus in specific areas like this? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, for example, um, the whole area of disaster recovery and contingency planning is something that is common to both business management in general and uh, IT security. I mean, we've done like tabletop exercises and extensive contingency planning here at the school just for our own risk management. And our facilities director is the, the lead of that. So uh, everything he does around physical security facilities, contingency planning, emergency communications, PR, that, that is all identical and exactly what you would also do for IT-centric emergency planning. So if that matter, physical risks like volcanoes, hurricanes, and so forth are an IT event. There's no doubt, for example, that this week Hurricane Sandy was a major IT event which kicked in all kinds of emergency response and contingency plans on the part of IT departments up and down the East Coast. Thank, thanks for that answer. Uh, Bob, we did get a couple of uh, questions and, and Tasso from the audience prior to the call. I'd like to bring one of those up. Roger, who's a fellow faculty member out there, he is asking about um, programs in terms of what it would take to be a forensic computer examiner. This is from Roger. He says, he teaches a course which deals with fraud and forensic computer examination. Many of the students ask what the path should be for becoming a forensic computer examiner. I'd like to hear that input. Give us some thoughts on that, and then Tasso, I'd be curious where that role fits in your organization. Okay, well, let me just start with one idea. The FBI has a great internship program. So if you can get into the FBI's internship program and spend, I think it's about nine months to a year with them, you're pretty much guaranteed an FBI job at the end. Uh, the problem with that one is it takes probably about a year of security clearance before they'll let you into the program. But I would recommend that one. I know the, uh, the NSA, the CIA, and other alphabet soup agencies are heavily recruiting in this area. And so if you like government work, there's many opportunities. Um, the only other thing I could recommend is there's numerous uh, different ways to study for forensic uh, security uh, certificates. And we have a number of schools and entities in our area that support that type of study. But uh, it's a highly demanded area. Again, there's a lot of legal effort around e-discovery and computer uh, forensics and litigation preparation. So I would encourage anybody with an interest to pursue the matter because I believe that uh, the industry will only grow. Mm -hmm. Tasso, is that position at the bank? Do you have a forensic yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's not only the uh, public sector that you can actually go into and, and seek internships, but you can also do it in the private sector as well. Uh, actually, I started off my uh, career pretty much uh, as, as an intern at the FBI myself, uh, and eventually made my way into uh, working for the uh, for the financial institutions. But uh, that's a good way to start. Uh, I think there are more opportunities in the private sector, uh, and it's a very good route to go. It's only going to grow. Great. I think we all also ought to contact the FBI and have them um, subscribe to our YouTube channel and pick up on this. They make it. They might learn a few things from from us. Let's move on to the in-demand careers, guys. I mentioned at the top of the hour that uh, you know the Bureau of Labor Statistics talks about that cybersecurity careers are going to grow at a rate that trumps many of the other technology areas. This is actually over 30% per year over the next eight years. Let's talk about what some of the drivers are for that growth. Uh, Bob, what are you seeing out there when you go to these conferences and where the what's driving the momentum behind careers in this area? Well, it's basically the Willie Sutton principle. You know, the famous bank robber was asked why he robbed banks, and he supposedly said, well, because that's where the money is. Well, okay, the reason the bad guys want to break in is because that's where the money is. So the reason we're spending money to gear up to protect our assets is because our assets are valuable. Uh, you know, the Internet connects more and more things all the time, and uh, the more value we put out there online, the more we need to spend and invest in order to protect it. So it's simple supply and demand, quite honestly. 
Yeah, and just to add to that a little bit, just think about the consumer that wants to do online banking. Uh, they definitely want to have the option to, you know, do online banking, whether it's their, you know, their their tablet or their or iPhone or Android device. So, and not only does it create more work for the financial institution to build those types of apps, mobile apps, but also creates a potential vulnerability in their environment and their systems. Hmm. So if I'm a recent graduate, it sounds like the job landscape is ripe and there's opportunities out there, but for where, how does somebody go about an approach this? If I were going to contact the bank, for example, Tasso, what department would I contact if I were a cybersecurity graduate? Well, you would have definitely start off with, uh, if you're in college, you start off with your college recruit uh, and go into their internship program. So there's definitely representatives from our organization that work with uh, in universities all over the country uh, to you know bring in interns to help us with our programs. Bob, what are you seeing? Where are people where are people getting jobs and what's the entry point into the organization? Okay, well first of all, in terms of how do you get a job, you've got the know how dimension, you've also got the know who dimension. So we have numerous security associations and meetups in our area and I always advise my senior students to get out there and start shaking hands and meeting people in the industry. Uh, because a lot of this is based on trust and based on getting to know people and that's a, a great point of entry. Now, as far as what people specifically do at the entry level, it often starts on sort of a help desk kind of uh, role or responsibility. But I've seen people go right into network management including you know massive cloud servers. Uh, penetration testing again has been a hot ticket for several of my students. Um, especially here on the West Coast, often the premium is not so much what your credentials are, the premium is what, what do you have the proven ability to do. So if you're out there, you know, in your private life, getting involved with cybersecurity events or clubs or meetups and you're demonstrating some skill, uh, you can often get a, uh, a shortcut into a pretty good uh, career position without necessarily, you know, having every little line item on the resume, you know, fully certified. Hmm. And to add one more thing, I think uh, I wanted to point out here, Peter, was that your uh, DeVry Alumni Association, your local chapter, can help link you up with individuals that actually work in the field, have, have experience, and can help you guide through uh, the necessary steps to get involved or become more involved with uh, cybersecurity. Interesting. You know, it's, it sounds like, uh, you know, this isn't something that you necessarily have to start out organically saying, I'm going to be in the cybersecurity space, I'm going to start as an undergraduate, take it through a degree. There's got to be a lot of people that are moving or transitioning from one career into this space. Uh, Tasso, I think you even did that. You didn't start in this industry, is that right? Not. No, I did not. So, Bob, what are we seeing in terms of, of what the momentum is behind students that are getting work here, and are you seeing people that are actually coming up one channel of business and then shifting over into the security side. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, the security uh, is something that receives all kinds of training and talent. I was just talking to one uh, company this week and they said they actually like to, uh, I said, what technical skill do you want to hire? And he said, we don't really hire for technical skill, we, we hire for general problem solving and we hire for certain personality types. So they have an internship program and they use that to filter who they like and who they think fits the team real well. Yeah. I think it's really a wide open arena. Just about anybody could decide at any time that they want to focus on cybersecurity and by uh, training for a year or two in, in one specialty or another they might have the point of entry. Tasso? I want to add to that a little bit. Um, you know, the most important characteristic for me is, is a person's, the individual's personality. Do they fit in well with or do they mesh well with the team that we have on the ground today? If they fit in, that's great. We can bring them in and, and add them to the team. But if they don't fit in, it, it causes some, some sort of friction with between a team that's an issue. Because there's a large amount of investment and time that you put into these individuals, so you want to make sure that they're right, the right individuals to begin with. Great. So just because you have the technical skills doesn't mean that you've got the personality. So there's, there's core business acumen that backs these jobs up. I mean, you're not sitting in a room with no windows cranking out, you know, code after code. There's an interaction uh, with consumers, with the team, so there's a there's a need for a well-rounded education as well. I guess. Yes. Yeah, there, there's some scope for people in a dark room to just code all day. I mean, there are a few of those specialists out there, but uh, the the team situation is the more common one. And one of the reasons that, that uh, cyber defense is so successful at getting students into the career field is because cyber defense activities are team activities. So you not only see students in the act of managing computers 
you see students in the act of interacting with other individuals in a teamwork situation under a stressful environment. And uh, that's very compelling for industry HR departments. Interesting. Guys, I'd like to step back a little bit earlier in the, in the student life cycle, get back into high school and understand a little more. And Bob, I'd like you to lead this discussion. What is driving the curiosity in today's students around this kind of thing? And, and can we start to grow this earlier? I know STEM, for example, in a lot of the school districts is a major momentum, one of the areas, frankly, that the United States could be better at. But what are you seeing as you're seeing people coming into college that's driving them from high school? Well, it's very convenient that you ask that because right here in this very lab, we're gearing up for a six-hour high school cyber patriot event today. That's going to involve about 18 cadets from a local ROTC unit, and um, they're uh, involved with um, a contest that's put on by the Air Force Association. Now, in this case, um, the interest is through ROTC and Civil Air Patrol, so these students have already a focus on a military career or security-related career. So. You know, the cyber defense is a natural fit for that interest. But, of course, uh, the military and the National Guard and the various um, security units in our area have identified the uh, cyber battlefield as something they need to gear up to be ready for. So um, that's all fitting really nicely together. Now, other high school students who are, don't have a military focus could also get involved with cyber defense simply because they're curious about how computers work and they like to understand all the underlying technologies. Uh, I find that cyber athletics essentially is kind of like the decathlon and that you have to understand all the different computer systems. So a lot of your just elite computer specialists gravitate towards cyber security simply because of the challenge level. Interesting. Guys, I've got, a, I've got a couple questions that have come in from our audience about the personality traits or characteristics common in people working, and Tasso, you touched on that, that it's not just the skills, it's the ability to interact. This question comes from Ivanis, and she says, is there a gender issue in the field? What do we see in terms of uh, gender issues? Is, it, is there a driving force in one way or the other? Are we getting enough women in the business? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's plenty of women working in the business. There's a lot of, in our organization right now, there's a lot of women that are senior leaders in our organization driving out direction vision. So that is absolutely not a concern. It should not be a concern. Mm -hmm. And what are you seeing, Bob, in terms of the mix of your classes? Is it um, I think me? there's, um, I mean, probably more men than women, but there's a lot of female leadership in cybersecurity in our area. I mean, my mentor at the master's level uh, is a woman who directs her own institute. Um, the chief information security officer in our state is a woman. Uh, many women lead our various professional associations. So I, I would strongly encourage any woman to pursue this career if, uh, if that's where she wants to be. I've got another question from Joshua, Joshua, and he says, what are the skills and qualifications necessary to be an ethical hacker? And I don't know that phrase. So somebody inform me what an ethical hacker is. I didn't think there was one. But Joshua wants to know what it takes to do that. Uh, let me go ahead and respond to that. There actually is a technical certification called CEH, Certified Ethical Hacker. It's put on by the EC2, which is the e-commerce council. It's a test you can take, a prometric exam like any other ones, and they have like a six or seven phase ethical hacking methodology that you learn. There's textbooks on it, there's tools on it. We teach all of that in our cyber defense program. It involves network discovery, it involves testing vulnerabilities, uh, it involves inserting uh, vulnerabilities into systems, uh, setting up a back door, maintaining control and covering your tracks. Uh, my student that's the penetration tester on contract, that's exactly what he's doing all day long for a you know, substantial pay rate, certified ethical hacking. It's absolutely a highly necessary career field. Uh, all of the PCI compliance, remember everybody who swipes a Visa card has to be PCI compliant. They need to be tested by certified ethical hackers to maintain their e-commerce position. Any ethical hackers at the bank, Tasso? Absolutely. We have a, we have a pretty good sized team that actually does that day in, day out. Um, I, I've actually worked with those guys very closely, and they're, they're a group, good group of individuals, and they know what they're doing. So uh, I think they have the most fun. That's great. Well, it sounds like it sounds like the careers happen as quickly as the problems happen. So, what are we seeing in terms of what student, students need to know going forward here? It seems like technology becomes obsolete fairly quickly. In terms of these threats, is there something we need to do in terms of training students 
so that they can stay on top of things like this? Bob, how are we staying in front of, of the problem here? Well, you have to run very fast to even kind of stay caught up with it. Um, really, I talked with a lot, of, uh, a lot of professionals and vendors this week at the conference on this very question. I think where we came around to is that the technology has become so complicated that it takes a lot of creativity, flexibility, and problem solving. Uh, there's no single technology you can master and say you're done. You always have to be on a learning curve. You have to be constantly adapting to a changing environment. So good communication, problem solving, intellectual curiosity, those are probably the hallmarks of people that are going to be successful in this field. And also being aware of what, you know, the next emerging threat could possibly be, right? Being aware of, you know, the new latest and greatest technologies, for example, because several years ago we had an issue with RSA and the certificates. Be aware of what happened there, what went wrong, and learning from the mistakes to move forward. And then learn about the newer technologies that are coming out and what potential vulnerabilities they may present for organizations and, and, and getting in front of that. So certifications definitely do help, but I think uh, institutions, organizations like DeVry University will definitely help um, since they have, you know, as you see behind Bob, uh, real, real live labs that they just work with. You know, guys, this is exciting. I mean, I'm a consultant. I deal with soft, soft skills, soft costs, and I, and I, when I think of the heroes that are in my life, I think of firemen or policemen. Or there's really this is an exciting career, and this is something that really generates heroes. So there are people out there that are that are saving millions of dollars, that are saving reputations. It's very exciting, and I'm curious if both of you would share with me what are you most excited about in the cybersecurity field going forward? Well, I. I'm excited to see my students go on to very successful positions, and I, I completely agree with you that uh, that America needs this. You know, our, our country needs it, business needs it, everybody needs it. You're really stepping up on behalf of the com community, and um, you know, it's um, I know it's just extremely valuable and gratifying uh, to see the, the good work that our students are doing as they graduate and, and go on into industry from us. Okay. Tasso, how about you? Yeah, same here. I'm, ha I'm happy to see, um, especially since I, you know, I've got my undergrad from DeVry University, I've got my master's from uh, Keller Graduate School. I'm really happy to see students come from DeVry and Keller that actually build that necessary skill set to come into the industry and help us work and uh, achieve certain goals. Um, I think the university is doing a very a fantastic job in, in talking about this more. It needs to be talked about more. Um, so I, I, I think we're heading in the right direction. I'm really excited about it. Terrific. Terrific. Well, guys, we're closing in on our time. Um, I'd like each to close out and just give me a sense of what piece of advice would you give to someone that was pursuing a career in cybersecurity? What's your parting thoughts on that? Uh, my thoughts are practice makes perfect. Just get out there, start working on whatever skill is, is right in front of you and, you know, practice, 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 and then connect up with others who share your, your interests and uh, team up in a club environment and support each other. Tasso, final words? Yeah, my, my recommendation and suggestion is that you reach out to your uh, DeVry local chapter, uh, your association chapter, get to know who, who's in your chapter, get to know who's graduating your class, uh, get to know the class, the student sitting in the same classroom, make sure you're make, building up that contact list because you never know who you're sitting next to. And I've actually made some really, I have some really good relationships with individuals I actually met in my classrooms. So um, that's my recommendation to everybody else. Great. Well, fellas, this has been a great conversation. I'm sure we could talk about this a lot longer. Bob, Tasso, thanks so much for your thoughts and insight on the topic. And, uh, you know, this was really fun. I enjoyed it. How about you guys? It was a great time. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Looking forward to the next one. Great. Month. Let's do it again sometime. You got it. You got it. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for your time. We hope the discussion was interesting and enlightening. This Google Hangout session has been streaming to the DeVry YouTube channel where the program can be archived for you to view again. And also, please share the link with other people. We'd like to thank DeVry University for hosting us today. For more information about how to be better prepared for the careers that are coming, as well as the jobs that are already here today, visit devry.edu forward slash know-how. Thanks so much. <laughs>